Section 7 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Wallace. Music provided by Project Gutenberg. December 10th and 11th, 1830. Rome, December 10th, 1830. Dear Father, it is a year this very day since we kept your birthday at Hensel's, and now let me give you some account of Rome, as I did at the time of London. I intend to finish my overture to the Einsame Insel as a present to you, and if I write under it the 11th December, when I take up the sheets, I shall feel as if I were about to place them in your hands. You would probably say that you could not read them, but still I should have offered you the best it was in my power to give. And though I desire to do this every day, still there is a peculiar feeling connected with a birthday. Would I were with you, I need not offer you my good wishes, for you know them all already, and the deep interest I, and all of us, take in your happiness and welfare, and that we cannot wish any good for you that is not reflected doubly on ourselves. Today is a holiday. I rejoice in thinking how cheerful you are at home, and when I repeat to you how happily I live here, I feel as if I were also a felicitation. A period like this, when serious thought and enjoyment are combined, is indeed most cheering and invigorating. Every time I enter my room, I rejoice that I am not obliged to pursue my journey on the following day, and that I may quietly postpone many things till tomorrow. Yet I am in Rome. Hitherto, much that passed through my brain was swept away by fresh ideas, each new impression chasing away the previous one. While well, here, on the contrary, they are all in turn properly developed. I never remembered having worked with so much zeal, and if I am to complete all that I have projected, I must be very industrious during the winter. I am indeed deprived of the great delight of showing my finished compositions to one who could take pleasure in them, and enter into them along with me. This impels me to return to my labors, which please me most when I am fairly in the midst of them. And now this must be combined with the various solemnities and festivals of every kind, which are to supplant my work for a few days, and to enjoy all I possibly can. I do not allow my occupation to prevent this, and shall then return with fresh zeal to my composition. This is indeed a delightful existence. My health is as good as possible, though the hot wind, called here the Shirako, rather attacks my nerves. I find I must beware of playing the piano much, or at night, Besides, it is easy for me to refrain from doing so for a few days, as for some weeks past I have been playing almost every evening. Bjornsen, who often warns me against playing if I find it prejudicial, gave a large party yesterday, where nevertheless I was obliged to play. But it was a pleasure for me, for I had the opportunity of making so many agreeable acquaintances. Torsvalden, in particular, expressed himself in so gratifying a manner with regard to me that I felt quite proud for I honor him as one of the greatest of men, and always have revered him. He looks like a lion, and the very sight of his face is invigorating. You feel at once that he must be a noble artist. His eyes look so clear, as if with him every object must assume a definite form and image. Moreover, he is very gentle and kind, and mild, because his nature is so superior, and yet he seems to be able to enjoy every trifle. It is a real source of pleasure to see a great man, and to know that the creator of works that will endure forever stands before you in person, a living being with all his attributes and individuality and genius, and yet a man like others. December 11th, morning. And now your actual birthday has arrived. A few lines of music suggested themselves to me on the occasion, and though they may not be worth much, the congratulations I have been in the habit of offering or of quite as little value. Fanny may add the second part. I have only written what occurred to my mind as I entered the room, the sun shining on your birthday. Music transcribed. <laughs>
Tomlinson has just been here, and begs me to send you his best regards and congratulations. He is all kindness and courtesy towards me, and as you wish to know, I think I may say that we suit each other remarkably well. The few words you wrote about P recalled him to my memory in all his offensiveness. The Abate Santini ought to be an obscure man compared with him, for he never attempts to magnify his own importance by impertinence or self-sufficiency. P is one of those great collectors who make learning in libraries distasteful to others by their narrow-mindedness, whereas Santini is a genuine collector, in the best sense of the word, caring little whether his collection be of much value in a pecuniary point of view. He therefore gives everything away indiscriminately, and is only anxious to procure something new, for his chief object is the diffusion and universal knowledge of ancient music. I have not seen him lately, as every morning now he figures, ex officio, in his violet gown at St. Peter's. But if he has made use of some ancient text, he will say so without scruple, as he has no wish to be thought the first discoverer. He is, in fact, a man of limited capacity, and this I consider great praise in a certain sense, for though he is neither a musical nor any other luminary, and even bears some resemblance to Lessing's inquisitive friar, still he knows how to confine himself within his own sphere. Music itself does not interest him much, if he can only have it on his shelves, and he is, and esteems himself to be, simply a quiet, zealous collector. I must admit that he is fatiguing, and not altogether free from irritability. Still, I love anyone who adopts and perseveres in some particular pursuit, prosecuting it to the best of his ability, and endeavoring to perfect it for the benefit of mankind, and I think everyone ought to esteem him just the same, whether he chance to be tiresome or agreeable. I wish you would read this aloud to P. It always makes me furious when men who have no pursuit presume to criticize those who wish to effect something, even on a small scale. So on this very account I took the liberty of rebuking lately a certain musician in society here. He began to speak of Mozart, and as Bonson and his sister love Palestrina, he tried to flatter their tastes by asking me, for instance, what I thought of the worthy Mozart and all his sins. I, however, replied that so far as I was concerned, I should feel only too happy to renounce all my virtues in exchange for Mozart's sins, but that, of course, I could not venture to pronounce on extent of all his virtues. The people all laughed and were highly amused. How strange it is that such persons should feel no awe of so great a name. It is some consolation, however, that it is the same in every sphere of art. As the painters here are quite as bad, they are most formidable to look at, sitting in their Café Greco. I scarcely ever go there, for I dislike both them and their favorable places of resort. It is a small dark room, about eight feet square, where on one side you may smoke, but not on the other. So they sit around on benches, with their broad-leaved hats on their heads, and their huge mastiff behind them, their cheeks and throats, and the whole of their faces covered with hair, puffing forth clouds of smoke, only on one side of the room, and saying rude things to each other, while their mastiffs swarm with vermin. A neckcloth or a coat would be quite innovations. Any portion of the faces visible through the beard is hid by the spectacles. So they drink coffee and speak of Titian and Pudione, just as if they were sitting beside them, and also wear beards and wide awakes. Moreover, they paint such sickly Madonnas and feeble saints and such milksop heroes that I feel the strongest inclination to knock them down. These infernal critics do not even shrink from discussing Titian's picture in the Vatican, about which you asked me. They say that it has neither subject nor meaning, yet it never seems to occur to them that a master who had so long studied a picture with due love and reverence must have had quite as deep an insight into the subject as they are likely to have, even with their colored spectacles. And if in the course of my life I accomplish nothing but this, I am at all events determined to say the most harsh and cutting things to those who show no reverence towards their masters, and then I shall at least have performed one good work. But there they stand and see all the splendor of those creations, so far transcending their own conceptions, and yet dare to criticize them. In this picture there are three stages, or whatever they are called, the same in the transfiguration. Below, saints and martyrs are represented in suffering and abasement. On every face is depicted sadness, nay, almost impatience. One figure, in rich episodical robes, looks upwards, 
with the most eager and antagonized longing as if weeping but he cannot see all that is floating above his head but which we see standing in front of the picture above mary and her child are in a cloud radiant with joy and surrounded by angels who have woven many garlands the holy child holds one of these and seems as if about to crown the saints beneath but his mother withholds his hand for the moment the contrast between the pain and the suffering below whence saint sebastian looks forth out of the picture with such gloom and almost apathy and the lofty unalloyed exultation in the clouds above where crowns and psalms are already awaiting him is truly admirable high above the group of mary hovers the holy spirit from whom emanates a bright streaming light thus forming the apex of the whole composition i have just remembered that goethe at the beginning of his first visit to rome describes and admires this picture but i no longer have the book to enable me to read it over and to compare my description with his he speaks of it in considerable detail it was at that time in the coronal and subsequently transferred to the vatican whether it was painted on a given subject as some allige or not is of no moment titian has imbued it with his genius and his poetical feeling and has thus made it his own i like shadow much and am often with him on every occasion especially in his own department he is mild and clear judging doing justice with due modesty to all that is truly great he recently said that titian has never painted an indifferent or uninteresting picture and i believe he is right for life and enthusiasm and the soundest vigour are displayed in all his productions and where these are it is good to be also there is one singular and fortunate peculiarity here though all the objects have been a thousand times over described discussed copied and criticised in praise or blame by the greatest masters and the most insignificant scholars cleverly or stupidly still they never fail to make a fresh and sublime impression on all affecting each person according to his own individuality here we can take refuge from man in all that surrounds us in berlin it is often exactly the reverse i have this moment received your letter of the twenty seventh and am pleased to find that i have already answered many of the questions it contains there is no hurry about the letters i asked for as i have now made almost more acquaintances than i wish besides late hours and playing so much do not suit me in rome so i can await the arrival of these letters very patiently it was not so at the time i urged you to send them i cannot however understand what you mean with your allusion to the coteries which i ought to have outgrown for i know that i and all of us invariably dreaded and detested what is usually so called that is a frivolous exclusive circle of society clinging to empty outward forms among persons however who daily meet where their mutual objects of interest remain the same who have no sympathy with public life and this is certainly the case in berlin with the exception of the theatre it is not unnatural that they should form themselves a gay cheerful and original mode of treating passing events and that this should give rise to a peculiar and perhaps monotonous style of conversation but this by no means constitutes a coterie i feel convinced that i shall never belong to one whether i am in rome or wittenberg i am glad that the last words i was writing when your letter arrived chanced to be that in berlin you must take refuge in society from all that surrounds you thus proving that i had no spirit of coterie which invariably estranges men from each other i should deeply regret your observing anything of the kind in me or in any of us except indeed for the moment forgive me my dear father for defending myself so warmly but this word is most repugnant to my feelings and you say in your letters that i am always to speak out what i think in a straightforward manner so pray do not take this amiss i was in st peter's to-day where the grand solemnities called the absolutions have begun for the pope and which last till tuesday when the cardinals assemble in conclave the building surpasses all powers of description it appears to me like some great work of nature a forest a mass of rocks or something similar for i never can realize the idea that it is the work of man you strive to distinguish the ceiling as little as the canopy of heaven you lose your way in st peter's you take a walk in it and ramble till you are quite tired when divine service is performed enchanted there 
You are not aware of it till you come quite close. The angels in the baptistry are monstrous giants, the doves colossal birds of prey. You lose all idea of measurement with the eye or proportion, and yet who does not feel his heart expand when standing under the dome and gazing up at it? Present, a monstrous catafalque has been erected in the nave in this shape. The coffin is placed in the center under the pillars. The thing is totally devoid of taste, yet it has a wondrous effect. The upper circle is thickly studded with lights, so are all the ornaments. The lower circle is lighted in the same way, and over the coffin hangs a burning lamp, and innumerable lights are blazing under the statues. The whole structure is more than a hundred feet high and stands exactly opposite the entrance. The guards of honor and the Swiss march about the quadrangle, and in every corner sits a cardinal in deep mourning, attended by his servants, who hold large burning torches, and then the singing commences with responses. In the simple and monotonous tone, you no doubt remember. It is the only occasion when there is any singing in the middle of church, and the effect is wonderful. Those who place themselves among the singers, as I do, and watch them, are forcibly impressed by the scene, for they all stand round a colossal book from which they sing, and this book is in turn lit up by a colossal torch that burns before it, while the choir are eagerly pressing forward in their vestments in order to see and sing properly and Bayani, with his monk's face, marking time with his hand, and occasionally joining in the chant with a stenorian voice. To watch all these different Italian faces was most interesting. One enjoyment quickly succeeds another here, and it is the same in all their churches, especially in St. Peter's, where by moving a few steps the whole scene is changed. I went to the very furthest end, whence there was indeed a wonderful coup d'oeil. Through the spiral columns of the high altar, which is confessedly as high as the palace in Berlin, far beyond the space of the cupola, the whole mass of the catafic is in the diminished perspective, with its rows of lights and numbers of small human beings crowding round it. When the music commences, the sounds do not reach the other end for a long time, but echo and float in the vast space, so that the most singular and vague harmonies are borne towards you. If you change your position and place yourself right in the front of the catafique, beyond the blaze of light and the brilliant pageantry, you have the dusky cupola replete with blue vapor. All this is quite indescribable. Such is Rome. This has become a long letter, so I must conclude. It will reach you on Christmas Day. May you all enjoy it happily. I send each of you presents, which are to be dispatched two days hence and will arrive in time for the anniversary of your silver wedding day many glad festivals are thus crowded together and i scarcely know whether to imagine myself with you to-day or to wish you dear father all possible happiness or to arrive with my letter at christmas is not to be allowed by my mother to pass through the room with the christmas tree i am afraid i must be contented with thinking of you farewell all may you be happy felix i have just received your letter which brings me the intelligence of Goethe's illness. What I personally feel at this news I cannot express. This whole evening his words, I must try to keep all right till your return, have sounded continually in my ears, to the exclusion of every other thought. When he is gone, Germany will assume a very different aspect for artists. I have never thought of Germany without feeling heartfelt joy and pride that Goethe lived there. And the rising generation seem for the most part so weakly and feeble that it makes my heart sink within me. He is the last, and with him closes a happy, prosperous period for us. This year ends in solemn sadness. End of section 7